Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Late Night Hockey with Steven Sahoyas. And I'm joined by a very special guest at this time, Julia Tashari from TSN. Julia and I, we go way back. We, uh, not too far back, but a few years back, we both went to Ryerson in the sport media program. Yeah. That's far enough back. That's far enough back. I was like so, born in Toronto when I started school. So that was like a second birth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> From it the very too- beginning. Yeah, from Julia's rebirth, I've known her in Toronto. <laughs> so, Julia, thanks so much for joining the show. What, what are quarantine days looking for Julia like these days? Oh, thanks for having me. This is fun. No um, what are quarantine days looking like? Well, I'm mostly working Monday to Friday right now. So, quarantine days are looking a lot like uh, trying to get up before I start at 9.30 and have a meeting <laughs> and, like, make breakfast, sometimes work out if I'm feeling really, really crazy. But then then the workday starts. So um, I'm at TSN social media department, which is bar down. Uh, and every day looks pretty different depending on, depending on the week, depending what sports events are happening. But like very generally, I'm making stuff for, for relevant and current stuff for all of our social platforms like YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, and then also writing stories for, for bar down's website as well. So that's what the day-to-day looks like. And then there's a lot of extra stuff that comes with working on social too, like working with our marketing department a lot on different paid programs. And then they also, as of pretty recently, I've been on sports center here and there. So going to the office to, to film those hits every once in a while. So it's been spicy every now and then there's a little bit of variety in my (laughs) day occasionally, but, but every day does uh, look a lot like these four walls (laughs) of my office space and, and the laptop. Yeah, no, I totally could relate to that. It's like in quarantine, I think everyone has found kind of like that workspace, that that spot where they can go to and like, all right, this is this is my escape, my semi escape, even though I'm in the same building that I've been in this whole time. This is where I can <laughs> yeah. go to and kind of get some work done. But You've been, obviously, we talked about it earlier, you went to the Ryerson Sport Media Program, attended that, graduated. What, tell us a little bit about your path in sport media to how you got to TSN today. Okay, so TSN specifically, um, I volunteered on a fourth year practicum project when I was in second year. And I I use this story specifically because I'm pretty sure that I wasn't the first choice to do (laughs) sideline reporting. I'm pretty sure they asked someone older than me to older than me to do it uh, at first. Uh, like obviously it was it was volunteer. You had to go to London for a whole day. It was November. It was outside. Like definitely it wasn't looking like the hottest gig. But I was in the second year university and I thought it was really cool. So I hopped in the car and I went to London. And Nico, uh, who was producing that production, worked in my department at the time. So he put my name forward when my boss um, was looking to expand the department a little bit more just as a result of me like stepping up and volunteering there. I think that's why I always tell this story because I did a whole bunch of things like you and I did all those Ryerson games together, built up a demo reel. I worked oh, yeah. for the Marlies and did fan experiences. I did a Ram- festival Rams stint Live. at Sportsnet. Rams Live! Yeah, okay, like that's Live. where we got all the reps yeah. in. <laughs> um, did a festival stint at Sportsnet during the 2018 Olympics running overnight, like literally just getting food. I don't know. Everybody's, everybody, you know this, like everybody's path into sports looks so different. I was having this conversation pretty recently. Like everybody that gets into sports has to have a certain amount of, like there's always a little bit of luck involved. Like what are the odds that I volunteered on this thing? And then Nico's boss happened to be hiring. But like in saying that, I also think that nobody really gets lucky without putting themselves over and over again in a position for somebody to see them and then, and for them to get lucky. Right. Exactly. So I was, I was really volunteering wherever anyone would have me and going out to every event, even if I didn't really feel like being there. And um, it's led to a few cool things. Yeah. I was just about to say, you know, you make your own luck and obviously going to school with you, working Rams live broadcast, working in class together. I know you're a hard worker and that's, that's what happens, right? Like, yeah. Like if you, hard. that's the biggest thing. I used to stress so much in school and I know, I know that people younger than us stress in the same way, but Genuinely, if you go out every day, you give it 110%. <laughs> uh, um, like somebody notices at some point, like even if you're not super, super good, like work really hard, eventually you get good. Hard, hard work is the biggest thing and just putting yourself out there. And 
that. Those two things specifically, <laughs> I think, are the biggest deal. Totally. And like you said, putting yourself out there, networking, that takes a lot of yeah. you know, confidence and a lot of hard work just to make sure that you're putting the, the right image out there and you're contacting and in connection with the right people. And yeah, it's, it's part of the hard work that goes into being in a media industry, like, like the sport media industry. So it's a cool story there from Julia about how she ended up with TSN. A lot of hard work. You make your own luck. So next thing I want to talk about is what you've been keeping up with as far as hockey goes these days. What storylines, what teams, what's been catching or piquing your interest these days in the hockey world? How do I not be really, really into the North Division? Like, I, I just the North Division, when, when, when it's on, it's hard. Do you find it hard to watch anything else? I don't know. You're kind of a Bruins fan, so oh, I might yeah, be talking I'm, the wrong crowd here. No, you know what? Honestly, every night when I'm watching hockey, I, I've got a few screens going at a time. Two of yeah. them, if they're on, I've got the North Division. Because Man, it's, it's good. It's highly entertaining. It's and been, it's so evenly matched. Like, I feel like it's the only division where all of the teams line up so well together. Like, yeah. And, and Any I, team could win every single night. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Early in the year, it looked like Ottawa might be a bit of a punching bag in the division, mm -hmm. but that's changed. Like Ottawa's looked really good lately. And obviously you have Toronto who's running away with the division as far as the standings go. But you know what? Like, you just saw now Vancouver. Beat. I'm not sold. I don't know. Not sold? I'm not sold. What is it? What is it about the Leafs? What is it about the Leafs that you, you just can't get fully over the, the fence on them and, and back that club? Trauma? Trauma? I don't know. I, I think I just know. I, I don't know. I could look at, I, I think their defense is way more legit this year. Agreed. Something about their compete level, I don't know if it does it for me yet. Just they got like those heart and soul pieces that I really, really like. I love Wayne Simmons. Can't wait to see more of him. I, I, w I was one of the people that was like, okay, I really liked Simmons with Philly, but I don't know if this really makes sense. And then I ate my words immediately because I was right on the Wayne train as soon as he came out. <laughs> um, same thing with Thornton. I, I was just another one that was like, okay, this is interesting. Let's see how this works out. But, but definitely added, added something to the team there. I think, well, they haven't, I heard them say the broadcast tonight, they haven't won a come from behind game yet this year. So there's, I don't know why that speaks to me <laughs> somehow. <laughs> like you can't, if you're not winning, you can't dig in and win one. And, and that's kind of, I don't know, that's not nice. I, that's kind of how I see this Leafs team. I don't yeah. know how they'll do if they ever have to face any adversity. Yeah, it, that's a good point. And I remember a couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember when Tampa Bay was like so far ahead of everyone else in the old Atlantic. Yeah. And then they get, obviously, you remember that, they get swept by Columbus in the first round of the playoffs. And first like, round. It wasn't the, that big newspaper publication. This wasn't the ending we imagined. It was like a breakup letter that the GM put in the newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was crazy. Yeah. There was like the tweet right after the game. It, but John Cooper spoke about that loss later on. And he said they got so ahead of everyone in the standings that they just weren't playing meaningful games down the stretch. And yeah. they were just getting by playing their own type of game. And, winning on talent and skill alone so that's obviously a cautionary tale but i can definitely see what you mean about the the no comfort behind victories they haven't been trailing a whole lot but i know what you mean like what what happens when they do kind of get that that mike tyson you know exactly. everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth right what happens then yeah totally like they they know all the teams in the north division and none of the teams in the north division have been there like achilles heel over the last 10 years like like i don't know i think i'll i'll feel a little bit more legit about it when when i see them out of this division um yeah i, I know, know. I, I know and that's gonna and it's it's crazy because it's like you look at it and this year they only have to beat one team if if let's say toronto is the team that comes out of the north division they only have to beat one team not in this division to get to a cup final which you know a little bit crazy. A long time <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, exactly <laughs> that I, I still but that being said I feel like every division is under such a microscope this year Buffalo God help Buffalo like what is going on with Buffalo the good people of Buffalo deserve better the good people of Buffalo deserve so much more yeah. Jack Eichel deserves more everybody deserves more but if you look at the division what was Buffalo to do like yeah. that's a hard division to be thrown in in a year where you're begging to to be competitive right it's it, it it's like a cruel fate totally. but right now they're in in kind of full 
combust mode. Like, I feel poorly for that. Because I, I wonder what it would have been like for Buffalo and if it would have looked any differently if it was just a regular season with the regular oh. alignments. Totally. It just feels like with Buffalo, it's just snowballed, right? Like, oh, it, every like, guy, no one... <laughs> nothing to the whole you, like anybody. Yeah. yeah. As is there anyone that's going to wake up and actually live up to their contract or live up to the potential of Buffalo? Because Jeff Skinner, another guy, hasn't lived up to. What it. is going on there? Not even lived up to it, but like, how do you be, <laughs> like? We're not winning. You think you try the guy? You have a bajillion dollars sunk into like. Oh. Try. What is what do you got to lose? I know, I know. And the healthy scratch, you can get into that about whether they should have. Like, I mean, if you're trying to get the guy going, putting him in the press box, probably uh, putting a veteran like that, at least in the press box, probably isn't going to do a whole lot to get him going. So I don't know. Buffalo, it just feels like, like you said, what were they to do in that division? But it feels like at this point, it's just snowballed and it's even worse yeah. than what anybody could have really anticipated. Oh, it's very, very bad. With, but with if, Buffalo. yeah. Everything's just under such a microscope. Like every team that's having a kind of bad time, I feel like we're just watching our own divisions that we're most interested in, like the Canucks and the Flames and the Habs firing, kind of cleaning house. And then you look at their numbers and you think, okay, wait, that's not that bad. And everybody seems to be hitting the panic button. I think um, it's an easier to kind of over, I don't know, overreact when you're looking at teams like that. They're just under the microscope so much playing the same teams over and over again it's easy to it's easy to feel like things are kind of catastrophic totally and, and it's like one team has you figured out and you lose a couple in a row because you're playing them back to back you're playing them yeah the, like the Leafs right now you look they play Vancouver twice in a row they lose both games maybe it's just a case of Vancouver has their number and then <laughs> yeah how does have... the Leafs beat Edmonton three times in a row yeah the key McDavid and Drysdale off the score sheet the whole time and then they can't beat the Canucks without Pedersen. Like, we're, they're still the Leafs. They're still the Leafs. <laughs> this is what I'll say about them. And, and you know what? Funny you mentioned it. Last time I had Victor on the show, uh, he was the last guest. I asked him about this North Division, and I, I looked at Toronto, and I still do as kind of the clear number one. But I did ask him who he thinks, if there's any team that can knock off the Leafs, would be that team. And if you were to say in a four out of seven series, which one team in this division right now do you think has the best chance of knocking off Toronto? Oof. I want to – something in me wants to say the Canucks. the Canucks. I don't know if it's because I just watched that game tonight, <laughs> but I, I feel like the, they do have their number a little bit. Um, I feel like they're the team that's the closest. You're right. On, in, on paper and – Logically, the Leafs should win this division. Totally. But I think the second best team, again, logically and technically if hockey won according to plan, which it just never seems to, <laughs> I think the Canucks are the second best team. Yeah. You know what? They, no team has really had the recipe to shut down Matthews, and what they did against him for two games was pretty darn impressive. Yeah. So I'd have to give it to them. I want to see how the Jets do this week. I've been saying I think the Jets – They got are, stopped tonight. They got What's stopped going tonight. going on there? Seven like, what one. went on? Yeah, it was I have no just, idea. It was just ugly. And they're, they're a team that I think is a defenseman or two short of, of really being a legit contender because I think they have the forward depth. I think they've got the goaltending. I just don't think they have the top four as far as, far as defensemen go. So mm -hmm. they've only played the Leafs once so far this season, and they lost 3-1. So not a whole lot of history to really gauge where they're going to finish or how they match up against the Leafs. So they play three this upcoming week. Maybe we're saying a different story next Saturday. Maybe it looks like Winnipeg might have the, you know, the secret elixir to beat Toronto, but I'm in agreement with you right now. I think the way we saw Vancouver handle Matthews, I mean, he was running all over this division before, before that <laughs> happened. And, and right. now to keep him quiet for two games, that's, uh, you know, that's definitely worth monitoring. That's something to note for sure. It'll be really interesting to see how this, how this whole year shakes down. Did, did you pick someone for the cup before the season? I'm sure you did. Who'd you bet? You know what? I actually didn't make any cup predictions. I had my division picks. I didn't okay. pick anyone for the cup, but I was kind of leaning towards Colorado. I was kind of leaning toward the Avs. On paper, it makes sense. Like they're, yeah. I think they should be the best team in the league. What's going on with them too? Yeah. Like what, what's going on in hockey? <laughs> I, don't I know. know. I know. Like, it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just a game where, like you said, on paper, things work out. But then you got this puck that bounces all over the ice. And, and there's ice and there's 
sharp stuff and everybody's got a stick and then yeah. it just becomes a lot after exactly. that. That's chaos. Exactly. Then it's chaos. So, but uh, no, speaking of hockey, we've been talking a lot about the hockey that's been happening on the ice. Unfortunately in the OHL, which is a league you and I, we've definitely kept close tabs on. Big hearts on the OHL. Yeah. Big hearts on the OHL. They haven't been able to play. We've seen the WHL come up with a plan and, and getting into their season with uh, the, the bubble, the WHL, WHL bubble. You've seen Red Deer. Obviously, everyone has seen those photos of them. The best thing in the world. <laughs> living at the arena a la, you know, hockey camp when you were 10, 12 years old. Where that's, that was your dream. Where you could just literally sleep. your dream. <laughs> just, just to sleep at the rink. And the QM, QMJHL has been running fine. And unfortunately, well, <laughs> you, oh, well not fine. Not, not, it hasn't been perfect. Yeah, I, should, that's I, should it, definitely, that's... I should definitely correct myself on that. It's been running, but there's definitely been speed bumps. There's definitely yeah, been definitely. Speed bumps. So the QMJHL is running. You know, it's getting better. It's definitely progressing from where, yeah. where it was at one point. But you still have the OHL with still no clear, concise plan, really, to, for a return to action. And what are your thoughts, you know? some people have floated around the idea of if this season doesn't go on, do you have overagers extended year? But then this also invites the idea of 22 year olds facing yeah, off against. Those kids. Yeah, exactly. Cause a lot yeah. of people think, you know, the kids that are going to be in the draft are going, are largely going to be okay. It stinks that they lose a year of development, but yeah. at large, the, the kids that were going to go in the first round are going to be all right. But mm -hmm you know, obviously you've covered the OHL, you know, that there's players that are in overage seasons where it's really one of the last cracks they have at putting something on a demo reel and on their, their resume to get to that next level. So, you know, how tough do you think that is for, for those players? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it, I can't imagine. I like, well, I guess we did the school version of it, right? We missed our fourth year, um, kind of all those culminating things. So, so I guess we did the school version of it, but even the, the kids um, that missed like the playoff part and the March part of their overage year. So then you'd have to take those kids into consideration too, right? Cause they really not, never got those last totally four or five months to prove it. I, I don't know. I, I know that it puts a lot of people in a really tough position. You're trying to decide, um, well, lots of those kids are trying to sign AHL or NHL or some kind of professional deal. They're trying to get into schools. Um, and then if you go to school, you're kind of stuck with the, what if I would have really vied for hockey? So, so that I really sympathize with. It, it, it's, it's really sad. It really sucks. Um, that being said, I would love if more more pro contracts came out of the OUA. So, so you know what I mean? Like, like there's, I, I still kind of probably feels like the end of the world for the most kids, but like, I don't know, go get 80 points in the OUA next season. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? I, I, I it's, it's not the end. I don't think unless players allow it to, I don't think it'll spell the end of the road. Like no one's going to say, Oh, we're the COVID season. Oh, that's you now. Like, it's going to be on those guys to really um, make something of this year for themselves, no matter where they play. Um, but, but that's my perspective. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. Like obviously there's not as many scouting eyes as far as pro teams go on OUA teams as there are, you know, scouts at OHL rinks and, and at CHL rinks. But at the same time, talent doesn't go unnoticed. It kind of exactly. comes, comes back to what we we're talking about sport media. Yeah, these, totally. guys, these guys are just a bunch of sport media students at the end of the day, if you want to bring <laughs> yeah, it back to, a, to an understandable comparison, right? Like they, they, if, as long as you put in the hard work, as long as you ha are dedicated and you, you show up and you prove that you're a good player, people are going to notice. And we've seen the exactly. OUA, OUA be a launching pad for a lot of pro careers, not necessarily always in North America. Sometimes it's overseas, but for, for these players, like you said, where it might be tough where you're thinking I lost my last season of development. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't, you know, there, there are definitely other avenues open. I, I, and, and one other thing too, I want to talk about the OHL is you just hope the league is going to be okay after this, right? Because you've seen yeah. firsthand how important these OHL teams are to their local communities, right? Cause obviously not having fans in the stand 
is a big it's a it's a big loss for these these leagues that really rely on that for revenue yeah exactly that's why i i've been seeing all the like not playing for kind of stuff and i i I just don't know if financially it's a possible thing like how do you put on these games and like run arenas and have a zamboni driver and have like pay all these people um when like the NHL is able to do it because they have TV deals. I, I just think about it from a very logical standpoint. I'm sure if I was 17 and I wanted to play in the OHL, I wouldn't think about it like this. Exactly. But I think about it like I, like, there's no TV deal that's going to cover the lost revenue from fans in the stands. The NHL can't even cover it. I don't see how the OHL, like, I, I just don't know how it's viable. But what I heard today, literally heard today, is that the talks now is they're planning to try and do. 12 games in April and 12 games in May. I don't know how that, with hub cities, I don't know if that's going to get approved either. But I, I also know, can just look at like the way the world is going right now. I, I kind of understand why for the government, like OHL isn't at the forefront of, oh, of, yeah. of what's going on. I, I, I'm, I, I totally sympathize with the players. I, I understand why, it, I totally understand missing out on things. Um, that feel vital right now but i also understand why it's kind of on the back burner totally yeah there's definitely bigger issues at hand as far as government decisions yeah. these days as long as nobody says no hitting on the ohl because that was the biggest that was tr- <laughs> <laughs> i know that was it's like you're gonna let People- them play but you're not gonna let them hit <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was more just like do you remember Okay, no. I'm going to use a Kardashian reference. You know when Kim <laughs> says to Chloe, other way around, Chloe says to Kim, Kim, there are people that are dying. Like it was mid pandemic, <laughs> things were bad, and everybody's on Twitter having a meltdown about the OHL not allowing hitting. It was like, I get it, but like people are dying. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Oh, I know. I know. It was, I think. Yeah, it was definitely one of those things where you had to take a step back and put it into perspective. At the same time, it was a very strange, like, rule. Like, just, yeah, just, it was just, bizarre. I'm just trying to think of, like, players actively avoiding body contact in a game where you've been yeah. taught really the... To, was it body like, contact or body checking? I don't even remember what the exact wording is. I can't remember if it was body checking or body contact. I'm pretty sure there was, like, a, a, a no... I'm pretty sure it was no contact, but it might have been no body checking. <laughs> Either way, it's just very hard to, yeah. to avoid avoid that. But also to a point you made earlier about hub cities, it would definitely have to be hub cities because yeah. the OHL, you've got three American teams, right? You got Flint, you've got Saginaw, and you got Erie. So you've got So three. would they not play? Because I think I heard that too. Like I, Yeah, I, I've – it's very – everything's very – as far as like what mm-hmm. a, a plan looks like, it's very – not, I don't want to say unorganized, but it's very other kind of, it's just not, it had, nothing has been really pushed very forward as far as a plan mm-hmm. goes. And I think that's why there's a lot of like, well, is it going to look like this? Yeah. What about these teams? Uh, well, they, they had one that was shut down, right? The first, the first plan they put forward, the government said no go, like yeah. come back with something else. So what I've heard is that they're going to come back with 12 games in April, 12 games in May four hub cities what, what would they be miss i think mississauga would be one yeah i think yeah i don't know you, out west like london for probably. those teams you'd probably definitely have one at the you know teams playing at the budweiser gardens yeah you'd probably have yeah. one up north you maybe have one in like sudbury or the sioux to get yeah i'm just trying to think which one of those rings are bigger yeah it might be it might be the I'm blanking on the name now, but the the, the Greyhounds have a, a pretty big arena. I know Sudbury's arena is a little outdated, so I, I think the Sioux's arena is a little bit bigger. I know North. The Bay. GLC is yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, whatever it's going to look like, you'll definitely have to have it'll it'll look very similar, to probably division wise to what we have in the NHL, where you have these geographically decided divisions, mm-hmm. and then you'll have one like the Central in the NHL, which is just like you know they just put the rest the the eight teams that were left in one division so you'll probably have one of the divisions look like that but it, it's going to be interesting to see i know you and i big junior hockey fans big junior yeah. hockey followers it, it would be nice to see it but like you've said too it's like there's a lot of things going yeah. on right now that definitely take exactly precedent. and you just kind of look at 
like what happened in the QMJHL, like there was a lot of COVID before they were able to kind of figure out how to do things safely. I think a couple of teams are shut down right now still. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't heard any, any, any mishaps in the WHL yet, which is good, but I think that are there COVID cases provincially much lower than ours? I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. Uh, it's, I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's kind of gotten to the point with, uh, you know, there's been so much coverage with the news that it's like, it's like, it almost. I have becomes, no idea what's going on. Yeah, I've got no <laughs> idea what's going on. It's like, I, there was a time where I'm like, I couldn't live without it. And now it's like, it's just like, every day I've heard this. It's like, okay, yeah. I've, I've heard, I, I keep hearing the same thing on the news. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But Julia, I got to ask you. This is the guest choice. Any topic right now on your mind that you want to talk about? Anything that, whether it's been, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to be on the ice, but anything hockey related that maybe you've just been thinking about. It's a spicy take that you've been, you know, simmering on the last few days or so. Anything on your mind that you want to talk about? I don't have any. Uh, do I have any spicy takes? I don't know. I really liked that Curtis Gabriel Gabriel fight with Ryan Reeves. Yeah, thought Curtis good. Gabriel did a really good job. What else did I love recently? I don't know if I love this, but I've never seen such anarchy in a hockey game. I've never seen such anarchy in a hockey game, Stephen, than what we saw the other night when the Boston Bruins collectively decided that they were going to kill Tom, Le- Tom Wilson. <laughs> they were going to kill him. They yeah. were banging the glass and for like, I have never seen such anarchy. It was insane. They were they were out for blood, and it it was so right after that Carlo hit. Then you have the start of the second period. Patrice yeah, but what was Brandon doing? Like I don't understand. Like Brandon turned around, and was like, "Yeah, what he said." What? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he, he just kind of just piled on. It's like this guy just gets hit in the head. You know, whether that was yeah. Wilson's focal point of contact or not. There's yeah. Heavy. I guess this could be our spicy take. Like I saw. Le- Do you see LeBron really slow it down? Like the initial point of contact, he said, like from the photos kind of looked like it was here, but then yeah, then it was here for it, sure. Head gets smushed right against the yeah. glass. And poor Carlo had to go to the hospital. He's been released since, but it stunk that he had to go to the hospital. But yeah, like you said, Verana goes right after, you know, right after <laughs> that happens, Verana kind of gets a shot in with the old two-hander. And then, and then it's like out for blood. The Bruins are, are in. Oh, they were mad. Kinda, yeah, they – it started at the beginning of the second period. Patrice Bergeron, before the puck even drops, skates over to Ovi and Tom Wilson, who are on the ice kind of stretching before the period. And I don't know what was said, but I'm sure he gave him a warning that that, that justice, oh, yeah. that, that hockey justice was coming. Cause... Would be served. And right before that, Marshawn's interview between oh, yeah. the first, like he was not afraid to say um, exactly how he felt about that hit. No, I don't know. Uh, what do you think of Tom Wilson? I think Tom Wilson is, I, I don't think he, I don't know. I don't want to say Tom Wilson isn't a bad guy, but like Tom Wilson is, Tom Wilson is a dying breed. Like Tom Wilson kind of fits into the same category as me as like mm, Matt Kachuk or like um, even Max Brady. Domi's one. Yeah, yeah Brady, Brady Kachuk. Kachuk too, even his brother. Yeah. But, yeah. like, not fully tough guys, skilled guys mostly, who are also really, really tough. Totally. So I kind of respect that. That's kind of a dying breed. Like, gives you, like, Wendell Clark vibes of, of players that are insanely t- Even, like, their dad, Keith Kachuk. Like, players who are really, really tough, um, but still really, really skilled. And usually you kind of, like, just the way hockey is, you have kind of one or the other. So there's something about Tom Wilson that's very appealing to me. If Tom Wilson, but like maybe with a little bit less head contact, existed more in the NHL, I think it'd be a pretty entertaining thing. That hit specifically was pretty insane. Just, just I don't know. He, he, he was lined up badly. I, I don't know. I don't know about that hit. Because I, I will say that I think because it was Tom Wilson, um, people were much quicker to, to really scrutinize the hit. Agreed. Yeah. When you've got the yeah. track record, it doesn't help. Yeah. It, it makes, it does make matters worse, but I agree with you that I think players like Tom Wilson, it's, there's definitely a fine line because he plays on the yeah. edge of that line every single night. And it's good to see players 
That, I was going to say Marshawn, but he fits Brad there Brad Marshawn, like, totally, yeah. totally. He's definitely been in the good books lately. He hasn't yeah. been suspended. There, you have, there hasn't been a whole lot. There's been no licking. So that's been good. That, that's, that's all that was, you can ask. Yeah, that was a phase, apparently. That was just a, a, like a, a, a month, a playoff long phase. But with, with players like Tom Wilson, you have these guys that play on the edge. And when you're throwing, you're constantly finishing your checks and looking to throw a big hit to spark your team. Because that's, that's the benefit of having these players, right, is they can get your team yeah. going other, in other ways than just putting the puck in the net. So when you have a Tom Wilson – it, it you almost have to accept the good with the bad and that hit was definitely part of the bad that you you have to face yeah. with Wilson but when he throws a big hit in a playoff series and he establishes a physical presence you see it's able to create some ice for him because players take note of who is coming down their wing or who is going into the corner with them and when you got a guy like Tom Wilson coming into your corner it's not uncommon to see some defensemen shy away or maybe make a mental error because they're thinking, you know, shoot, I got Tom Wilson barreling down exactly. on me. Like I better make a play quick. So exactly. it's, 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 it's definitely a give and take with guys like Tom Wilson. Yeah. And just in saying mental errors, like someone like Tom Wilson, who's always looking to finish his check and always looking to make the hit like a mental error. When you, when you turn over the puck or a mental error, when you, a mental error, you make a mental error on the ice, like, for really physical players, a mental error could also be like making a hit, making a bad hit, like a hit in a split second where a player wasn't lined up, right? Totally. So, so when you play at that intensity, things like that happen and you get reputations and it happens. Tom Wilson, definitely not saying we should nominate him for the lady big or anything, <laughs> yeah. but um, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I think he's that kind of player and he'll, he'll attract that kind of attention, but I don't think he's going up trying to hurt guys every night. No, and, and he realizes that if, if he is, it's going to cost him games, right? Which ultimately, yeah. not only cost him money, but he's no good to the Capitals in the press box either. So it's, it's definitely not his intention. But when you play on the edge like that and you're as, as aggressive of a player as Tom Wilson is, you're going you're gonna to cross that line on occasion. Yeah, so definitely. That, that, was just, that was just one of those times. But I agree. I think, I think players like Tom Wilson aren't bad for the game. I, I think having physical players that are have size, speed, and skill, never a bad thing for hockey. No, it, it's yeah. just just channeling that the right way sometimes, and, and that's been Tom Wilson's issue, unfortunately, in the NHL. Yeah, definitely. But that's going to do it for this episode of Late Night Hockey. Julia, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate having you on. It was good to catch up, too. It had been a while, so it was really nice to catch up with you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me, Steve. It was awesome.